Well, Agency Enlightened is here, ladies and gents. I hope you enjoy this module as much as I enjoyed making it for you and delivering it to you today for free. Oh my God, for free from my heart and from the heart of all of humanity. Enjoy and know that I am no longer in business. I've sold pretty much all my equity in Better AMS. I'm now an inactive partner who holds a minor stake and that is official, signed, on the dot. Wow, seven or eight years of running and that thing and starting it and I am out ladies and gents it feels fantastic and I pray that all of you who are going on this journey are served well by the content in Agency Enlightened and that it helps you reach a point where you have financial freedom and that you can live in the middle of the jungle and hold this tripod thingy with a with a straw hat and talk about whatever you want to talk about, okay? So enjoy this module and know also that there's a link in the description for accessing the resources and the action items that you need to, um, you know, complete whatever the module is. It's all there, it's all free. And know that if you want to support the nonprofit that I'm starting called Satori, you can go in the link in the description and you'll be able to opt in to uh, be notified when the Satori podcast goes live, which is gonna be probably in a matter of two or three months or something like this. Um, real quick, before the module begins, you can just fast forward and skip this intro because it's gonna be on the mo every single module intro if you don't wanna uh, know this, but Satori is a nonprofit dedicated or devoted to uh, helping mankind realize the self by sharing God's word. So that's what I want to do, and uh, that seems to be where all my energy is going these days. If that sounds interesting to you, you can go and check it out and drop your little email in the landing page thing, okay? Thank Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Mary, and Mother Teresa, and all the great sages and avatars that walked on this earth. May it be so that all of what is spoken out of Satori is heard and understood by all of mankind and uh, that it is felt as the gift that it is from my heart, okay? Mwah! I love you all very much. All right, ladies and gents, we are rolling. Welcome to the Service Pricing Module. My name is Taylor Bentrude, and I'm gonna walk you through it. Here's what we're gonna cover today. Teaching what we know, the perfect price, value-based pricing, auditing abilities, pricing, evolution, and contracts. First and foremost, teaching what we know. This is a mental model that we will not break. We cannot teach you what we do not know. Now, recurring. This module defines the ideal pricing model for your service that, based on what we've discovered for agencies that are offering recurring services, right? Any type of service that's recurring is basically one that aims to retain the client for an infinite period of time. This module is not designed for an agency that's offering project-based services. We have no experience running a service that offers, you know, uh, services for something that's project-based. A web design agency that designs websites would be what would be considered like a project-based service. But with that being said, um, if you do run a project-based service, this is probably the best piece of information I've ever come across for understanding pricing and the sales process in general for agencies that provide project-based work. Okay, the book is called as you're seeing on the screen here, the win without pitching manifesto. It's literally like 90 or a hundred pages. It's a very quick read and you can tell by the ratings of this book, it is a legendary book. Even though, um, we don't offer project based service pricing. I read this myself and got tremendous value out of it and I highly recommend it. So even if you don't have a you know, project based, uh, pricing or type of service in your agency, still a great book to read. I, I found it highly enjoyable. So, but if you do have project-based um, service, then this is really the action item that you can take away from this module. It's truly just this because this book will provide 10 X more value than something I can tell you when I have no experience with it. All right, moving forward. If you have a recurring uh, based service, great. This will all be applicable to you. Um, even if you just have a project based pricing or project based service, I mean, you can still go through this module. It's not going to hurt you. Um, but it's less relevant. Definitely. So the perfect price, optimal retention. I mean, the perfect price is ideally at a level that's optimal for retaining the client as long as possible. It has optimal margins. The per the perfect price is, you know, at a level that's optimal for maintaining strong margins in your agency as well. And it's fair, meaning that the pricing from the client's perspective is relative, uh, is relative 
client's perspective is relative to the value that your service provides uh, and the average market rate. We're going to talk more about the average market rate and how that ties into your pricing. Um, Evolution is an important factor to, to touch on here. As your agency grows, it's likely that the once what was once a perfect price or uh, pricing model for you um, is going to change. And the, what you once would have considered a great rate may be too low for you as you scale. Now, um, I can't guarantee this, but I would say the vast majority of, his, majority of agencies as they scale are likely going to see prices increase. With what Destiny put in the bottom of these slides here, if your efficiency improves, maybe it decreases because you're doing more work with less time. Um, and that's a very true and valid point. However, I would say that uh, likely there's a there's just a point of diminishing returns where you've made your service so efficient that you can't go any further. And if that's the case and you really can't squeeze out more efficiency, then it's going to be price increases likely that's going to... Um, you have to go up uh, as your agency scales and you hire more people. So moving forward, let's talk about value-based pricing. Charging on time. The average freelancer or solopreneur will charge hourly regardless of value delivered. This is a very common pricing model that people use when they're starting out. But charging on value, the average agency owner should be charging on their value added um, regardless of the time spent working that's it. Now, this is an, a scenario where there's two different people offering the same service at the exact same quality and they deliver the exact same results to their clients. This this month, let's say hypothetically this month, both people only spent two hours working on their client account. On, and, and let's just say the same value, everything was the exact same. Now, uh, John, he charges on time. He's on the left here and he charges client $300 for this month's work. That's a $150 hour rate. He's probably pretty proud of that. That's pretty good. $150 an hour is a really high rate. But Alex on the right hand side here, he charges on value and he charges his client $3,500 for this month's work. And that's a $1,750 per hour rate, which would seem absurd to John. John would think that a $2,000 per hour rate is, is, is impossible. Nobody would pay that. And John's correct if, in thinking that because charging on time becomes a bottleneck in itself because no one would ever pay $2,000 per hour. And, uh, you know, we would, it, it, most of our, for the accounts that we have that we spend two hours a month on, if that's the case, and we're charging them $3,500 for the month, you know, the, like, just imagine if we sent an invoice to the client and we said, hey, we spent two hours on your account and it's $3,500. I mean, they would, they would they'd be like, what? Right? But no, that's not how it works. When you charge on value, you don't mention time. And time is never a question in the client's mind. They just care about results. And that's what happens when you approach a deal with a value-based mindset. So how do you measure the value of your service? Great question. There's a few variables to consider. Competition being number one. Knowing the average rate of your competitors allows you to really have a better understanding of what the floor and ceiling of pricing looks like amongst your competition. And this kind of allows you to have a better price for, uh, allows you to better price your services. The reason for that is, and we'll actually, this will get into it, the impact. You can't charge 10x what the competition is charging unless you somehow provide 10x the results or value. Uh, the, the impact of your service on the client's life slash business is another factor to consider when setting your prices. Um, but most importantly, you know, ultimately you can only charge a multiple of whatever the value is that you deliver. And that multiple has to be in line with the, the market rates. Like you cannot charge 10 X what the competition is charging and deliver the same results over time. Everybody will catch on and, or, and you'll never be able to sign clients because they'll just know that it's an obscene price. So that's why we started with competition. That's why it's an important thing to understand what your comp competition is pricing uh, their services as so you can get a general feel of where the markets, uh, what the market average rate is. Okay, if you're in a real blue ocean and you're like one of two agencies in the market, well, you're in the wild west and uh, you can probably charge ridiculous amounts that you won't be able to in a few years when it gets more competitive. Uh, balance, let's talk about balance. The optimal value-based price is dependent on the two variables above and obviously the potential impact that your service can have is different depending on how ideal the lead is, right? If a really ideal client comes through the pipeline, you know, it's likely that your price is gonna be a little bit higher because you can provide more results for them because they're really ideal. If it's less ideal, but still workable in the sense that you can service them, you're likely gonna charge less because you know the, the, the results you can probably provide are less likely to be as much as it would be for a really ideal account. 
that's a pretty straightforward and simple thing to understand. Um, but you, 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 the optimal price is really based on the two variables above um, and considering that it's different for every lead that comes through and how ideal they are. So experience is an important thing to consider. If you've only worked with three clients in the history of your agency, you'll likely have difficulty finding the ideal price. That's just because you don't have enough experience. And as you gain more experience, pricing your services will become easier. You know, pricing your services in the beginning for 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 me, like in, in, in Better AMS when it was just me, and then even as we evolved when Destiny came into the agency, it, it was kind of like, we don't really know what we're doing. But we're pricing our services here because we think it's pretty good and we have some form of logic, but really only until we made a lot of good deals and a lot of bad deals did we get a good sense as to what a good pricing model would be for our agency. Now, let's talk about auditing abilities, forecasting. A great audit, it's just an invaluable tool to your sales process in your agency. It's really gonna allow you to have better understanding of how much, an, uh, how much the impact of your service can be on the client prior to you working with them, which really allows you to better price your service, uh, um, surprisingly. <laughs> and so when you can better price your services, obviously what happens is you're gonna drive more revenue, you're gonna have higher margins, you're gonna get you know more like out of the deals that you sign. That's why an audit kind of like forecasting tool or just a really good audit process is an invaluable tool because it allows you to have better deal structures. So if you have no form of audit process, this is a really low hanging fruit uh, that allow you to drastically improve your sales process and the deals that you, um, that, that you design for the clients that you have. Now, experience. As I said before, only once you've really worked with enough clients and you've made enough deals can you begin to understand how to build a great audit system allowing you to forecast the impact of your service. You gotta have a good amount of experience to be able to build an audit system. In the first year, year and a half, maybe it was two years of running Better AMS, we had no like forecasting audit system. I mean, we had the most basic audit system ever. In the first year, we had no audit system. It was truly just like, okay, <laughs> you wanna work with us, great. Um, here's how much our pricing is gonna be, and we had no idea what we were doing. Um, in the second year, as we got more experience, we were then able to say, okay, you know, we've seen some trends here. Um, typically, if we see this, we can expect that, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so how our audits, auditing works is we have an audit channel in Slack. Um, as soon as uh, Destiny or somebody in the, in the sales team qualifies uh, a lead and we are going to move forward and, and run an audit on them, we'll just request to run an audit on them and Lee will pull the audit. And this is kind of what our auditing tool looks like now. We, it's, it's a whole lot of data. And again, yours may not look like this. This is just an example that's contextual to our agency and the service that we provide to the market. Um, that we're servicing. And um, it, it fortunately, we offer a service that's highly data oriented. And so we get lots of data in the auditing process. And because we have lots of data, we can make a very, we can get a very data driven, you know, audit that, that gives us a relatively accurate forecast on the potential results that we could drive. So this is a really invaluable tool. I know that Destiny uses it all the time throughout the sales process for every single account that comes through that we do an audit on there's very rare cases where she won't use this. Um, and if she doesn't use this, she'll have her own process for auditing the brand. Let's talk about pricing evolution. So retainers, uh, a flat fee based pricing model. That's what a retainer is. I'm sure everybody here knows what that is. What are the pros of, the, of, of using a retainer model for your pricing? It's pretty straightforward. I mean, the client will always know what your fee is. That's a huge pro because when you're on performance based, the, client, the, the pricing fluctuates and clients don't like fluctuating prices. If they're going all over the place. One month it's 3,000, one month it's 9,000, the next month it's 15,000. It makes it difficult for them to budget out what their expenses are gonna be and what they're gonna spend on your agency. So a pro is that, you know, flat fee, clients always know what your fee is. Uh, you'll always be able to forecast your MRR, monthly recurring revenue, since retainers don't change. That's pretty pretty obvious. It's a safer pricing model in general. And if you're in the early stages of growing your agency, it'll really give you peace of mind uh, because your MRR is not fluctuating all over the place and because you're um, able to just kind of better control, you know, the, the, the overall profit of where your, what, your, what your agency will be at the end of the month. Much more difficult when you're running off of um, performance based. So cons, if workload increases for whatever reason, then you'll lose out on margin and your margins will decrease and you won't 
see any benefit from workload increasing. Uh, if you have a significant impact on the client's business or life, uh, you know, you won't benefit from it. It's your pricing is going to stay the same. Whereas performance based benefits, if your results drop drastically, the retainer won't automatically adjust and a client may want to drop you due to this. Now in a performance based model, you know, the, the, the opposite is true because it's per partly performance based. If your results drop, then the retainer drops. And so that's a pro to the performance which we'll get to here in a second. And last con here is rene renegotiating for a higher flat fee is typically the most painful and not fun prof process you can go through with a client and it sucks. So you kind of want to avoid that at all costs. Um, but it's, Inevitable, you'll have to have these conversations with some clients at some point in the future. However, you want to avoid it. And so that's a con that comes with flat fees because uh, as you grow, you may reach a point where these $1,000 per month clients are no longer profitable for you and it doesn't make sense for you to manage them. And you'll have to go to them and say, hey, sorry, I mean, our new minimum is $2,000 and uh, they probably won't like that. And that's not a fun conversation. Let's talk about retainer plus performance. This is the hybrid pricing model that we now use in Better AMS, and it includes a flat fee and a performance-based fee. Okay, so the pros of this is really that closing deals with higher average retainers is easier because clients usually don't expect you to drive as much value as you do, uh, and this is this leading to a win-win uh, scenario. So like low risk retainer for the client plus mutually beneficial incentivized growth. Really, that's what, what it is when it comes to the hybrid model. Again, just to repeat that, a low risk retainer for the client plus mutually beneficial incentivized growth. That's a high, that's, that's, that's a strong pro in the mind of a client when they're thinking about, you know, pricing and working with you. Uh, especially if you articulate it like that on the phone call when it comes to the pricing, you know, if they have concerns, you can say, look, no, this is how it is. You know, this is, this is a lower retainer. Um, and we have mutual beneficial incentivized growth, right? It's pretty easy to explain the pros of the, of the, of a hybrid model relative to a retainer model to a client. Now, the second pro here is that we get the security of a retainer and the upside of, of, of the impact that our service has on the client's business, right? So you have some form of retainer that's guaranteed MRR. And if you want to calculate what your guaranteed MRR is going to come to, assuming all the clients that actually pay you, uh, you'll know what that number comes to. And then on top of that will be the performance-based uh, you know, fees, which will be calculated likely at the end of the month. Now, on great months, our retainers can sometimes be more than double whatever the flat fee would have been. So if the flat fee is $2,000 and our uh, performance-based fee is, let's just say, 2% of Better AMS campaign sales, um, then sometimes our retainer may come to $4,500 if we drive a lot of sales from our campaigns. And typically, if we do that, the client's fine with it because we drove a lot of sales, right? And so it justifies the increase in the fee, which is a nice model. The set, the last point, this is probably one of the most important points. You know, this model scales as the business scales. So if a company gets larger, you know, the client's company gets larger and our workload increases, that will be reflected in the additional growth that we are driving, right? So in our agency where we do advertising and um, if a client launches a ton of new products and they're drastically, they're rapidly growing their business, well, that means that we'll be able to drive more sales. And on this model, that means our retainer should be going up right? So we're incentivized um, and it's mutually beneficial. Now, here's some of the cons. It's more difficult to forecast MRR. So yeah, it's just difficult for you to know what next month's uh, monthly revenue could be. It can be harder to sale. Uh, it can be a harder sale for clients who don't know what to expect out of the, you know, the fee. We usually mitigate this by letting them know the average growth that we drive. Um, so we can tell them, Hey, you know, the average growth that we'll see is this. And so your performance based fee is typically probably going to be somewhere in this range. And we also tell them that, Hey, we're really flexible. And down the road, if the retainer gets too high, we can adjust it. So we're really transparent. We always do our best to optimize for the client's experience. And in telling them these things in the sales process, it really puts them, you know, at ease, um, with their concerns about this pricing model. Okay. Now, and the last con here is sometimes the performance fee can cause the overall retainer to be too high, frightening the client and giving them sticker shock. This isn't really a bad thing if you are proactive about reduce, reducing retainers when they're too high, 
This is actually a pro, you know, if you adjust retainers proactively when they are too high, because it tells the client, hey, you're willing to reduce the rates without even them asking. And this builds a lot of trust. Some clients won't even expect you to reduce the rates and they would have paid the retainer or whatever it was if it was too high. Let's say it was like $9,000 when it's typically like four to five, just because you drove a lot of sales or it's like a, it's, it's a high seasonal month, et cetera, whatever the reason may be you know, they will love you for that. And that'll, they'll, they'll deeply value that because it goes against the agency norm. Typically agencies do not empower their people to reduce retainers. That is so against how the agency norm, uh, operates. Right. And so in doing so, it's just like a shock to them and it builds a lot of trust. One other con, um, actually we'll, we'll, we'll that we that we cut we cleared and we covered let's keep rolling forward here so the perfect hybrid this is a little bit more in the weeds but we like to structure our pricing so that 60 to 70 percent of the fee will come from the retainer on average and 30 40 percent uh will come from the performance-based fee so if our average uh fee for our clients in our agency is four thousand dollars you can expect about three thousand dollars of that to be uh flat fee and the rest to be um, to be performance based. That's about a 25% split. So yeah, that, that, I don't know if we had an exact science. I think that's just kind of naturally how it's, uh, how our, our pricing has evolved and it's worked for us. And so we like it and we've kept it the same for quite some time now. Uh, consistency. So this keeps the overall retainers within a similar range throughout the year, which is a good thing. Um, fluctuation. I mean, you can imagine the more performance based you're pricing, the more it will fluctuate, the more retainer based, the less it will fluctuate. And, we just like this 60, 70% split. It, again, I don't think it's an exact science. We've just kind of naturally come to um, seeing these th th this ratio. But I like it because we have done models and I've closed deals before in the past that are 100% performance-based. And it's just, there's, there's a lot of sticker short shock to the clients when there's no consistency. People value consistency all, in, in all aspects of life. And so when you have a thousand dollar per month retainer one month and eight thousand dollars the next month, it can really mess with with the mindset of the client and they, they they just don't like that. And honestly, think about it. If you were somebody paying an agency and the fees fluctuated that much, yeah, you probably wouldn't feel good, too good about it because one, it's it's all over the place, which is just kind of a red flag in general. It's like, why is this thing all over the place? And two, it just doesn't really give you a good idea as to what you're going to be paying this agency at the end of the year if you want to do some budgeting, etc. Blah blah blah. So that is a a good uh, as, um, touching on price, pricing evolution. We in Better AMS started at, with retainers and we evolved to a hybrid model. In the process of this transition, where we evolved from retainers to hybrid, we tested out strictly performance based. We tested out higher retainers based. We tested out hybrid models where it was majority performance based and very small percentage of retainer. And we tested a lot of different things. Over the course of two to three years, we've transitioned fully to a hybrid model and we've gotten into the good, we've gotten into what we feel like is a sweet spot for us um, in, in our, in our pricing. And again, it's changing every single year. This year, we're likely going to have even higher average fees than, than last year. Last year was definitely much higher than the year before. And it seems to be going up. And with that, it's changing, of course. So as I've just said, pricing changes as your agency evolves. So will your pricing models. And the reason for this is because you typically, as you scale your agency, get more OTB focused talent. OTB just stands for on the business. On the business, I define to be when somebody is working on growing the business. They're not in the day-to-day -day operations, servicing clients or doing anything that's kind of like day-to-day -to, -day to maintain the business. Um, they are more on the growth end. So somebody that's in sales, um, trying to you know sign more clients and, and get more leads, um, great, that's OTB. Somebody that's in marketing, that's OTB. Somebody that is in leadership, that is you know laying the strategic vision for the company in the in the future, that's OTB. Okay. Other things, um, we can talk about ITB later in in, in in different models, but it stands for in the business. And it's people who are more more focused on the day to day operations. But anyways. As you grow, you're going to have more OTB focused talent. And um, these people don't typically, they don't manage accounts. And so they don't manage any MRR. They don't manage any revenue from clients, which means your overhead of like salaries is going to go up, especially if these are OTB people 
um, like bookkeepers and general assistants or a general manager. These are more people that aren't really like salespeople or marketers, but but they, they cost, they have salaries and, and, and they're essential to managing the business, like a bookkeeper or somebody that can manage uh, accounts receivable and make sure that you guys are getting paid on time. Like it, it doesn't necessarily drive or increase revenue. It, it just helps maintain a healthy business and it costs money. And so with hiring these people and making the operations of your agency better, your margins are going to go down. And uh, in in margins going down, your pricing is going to have to go up to balance that. Or as uh, we stated earlier, the efficiency of your service is going to have to drastically increase. So the average MRR per AE, this is an important metric, which we're going to talk about more in future modules to come. But to cover the cost of these OTB focused salaries that don't necessarily drive revenue, you'll need to increase the overall average MRR, monthly recurring revenue, per account executive. Account executive we define to be somebody who manages clients. Otherwise, margins will deteriorate into the red over time. Okay, and natural increases, as your agency grows, it's likely that your average monthly fee will increase with it. I think it's a natural part of the process, unless you were, for some reason, running an agency that has the most inefficient processes ever, and you have potential to just, like, reduce the or increase the efficiency like tenfold um which is very rare very 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 few agencies are like running super so inefficiently that uh they have the ability to drastically increase their op their their um their operations and their efficiencies to increase their margins typically you probably have a decent enough system and you can't triple or quadruple the efficiencies to reduce the costs drastically with that all being said, let's get into contracts. So service contracts, we are kind of anti-agency in the sense that we do our best to provide the best experience for the client. Making them sign a one-year binding contract is usually not in their best interest. It's typically no fun, and it's really high risk on their part if they're locked into this contract, especially if they don't like the agency in the first month. So we also really believe in our work, and if our clients are happy, they will stay. Uh, really, that's what it comes down to. And with that being said, uh, we don't do binding contracts. We just have a 30-day notice in our contract. So um, none of our contracts are binding. It just simply says, it asks the client, you know, if you want to terminate the relationship, um, great, give us a 30 day notice so that we can transition the account back into your hands properly. That's it. So 30 day notice, cancel at any time. Literally two days after working with us, if you're not happy, you can cancel. It's never happened before, but uh, it's there. And this is easier, makes the sales process easier because when you don't have binding contracts, it's very appealing. Uh, to the client or the potential lead who's thinking of working with you um, because you're now an agency that has an offer that's less risk for the client because typically agencies are offering binding contracts, which is higher risk for the client to take if they enter a binding contract because what if it doesn't work out? And what if it doesn't work out in the first 30 days? Now they have to pay out 11 months of like whatever the fee is for this agency to get out of working with them. It sucks. It's a really it's it's really a lose win uh, and a lose for the client, a win for the agency. And so I don't like it. I've never felt morally good about it. Um, maybe there's scenarios where it makes sense. I know that there's services like SEO that really take time for 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 the results to kick in like like 6 months. And so Really, okay, if, if that's the situation and that's the context, maybe you can justify a contract and you can explain the context behind why you have that binding contract because it takes that long to get results and some people back out too early, blah, blah, blah. I mean, okay, maybe that makes more sense. So take this with a grain of salt. It's not indefinite. It's not permanent. It's not you know always the case, uh, but typically it's the case that binding contracts are not beneficial and a lot of agencies abuse it. Now, Lower evaluations. This is a con to not having binding contracts is that it reduces the evaluation of your agency if you plan to sell. Uh, and if you've never had issues, this is just a random point, if you've never had issues selling binding contracts, then don't change anything. I mean, why would you? Like if you've been doing it for years and you've always ha been doing it, you never have any issues, no objections in the sales process, why would you change it? Don't change it. Like if it, that's actually an epic that you can do binding contracts, you've never had issues, right? For us, um, we I have tried to do it before, and we have done contracts before in the in the past that were binding. But again, it's just we found there to be friction, and mm, we uh, th therefore don't do it. Now, 
e-signing software. This is also a bit of a random note, but it's a must that your contracts are extremely easy for the client to sign. You should never ever send a raw PDF forcing them to print it out, sign it, scan it, um, and then like send it back to you. If you're doing this, pay for an electronic signing software. We use uh, PandaDoc. There's tons of e-signature contract softwares out there that you can utilize. Just make sure you don't send them some random PDF. I mean, it's fine if you're just starting out and you have like your first client and you have no revenue, but like after your first client, you should probably get an e-signing software right away because it's a real pain in the ass and it's gonna help your conversion rate. It reduces friction in the sales process. It makes it easier. You're gonna close more deals. Simple as that. Now here's your action items. Pretty straightforward. The Win Without Pitching Manifesto. Buy and read this book if you're running a project-based service. Um, pretty straightforward. Really great book. If you want to go the extra mile and you want to just have a great book to read and you're, but you have a recurring-based service, I highly recommend you read this book as well. It's just a fantastic read. Um, extremely interested. And there are some things that do apply to recurring-based uh, services. It's not 100% applicable to somebody that has a, just a, just a project-based agency. Um, but step two, service pricing worksheet. There is a worksheet here attached in the resource section below. Um, you're going to see it. Check that out. Download it. Open it up in Google Docs. There's a, there's a quick video that will walk you through this entire sheet. In the video, I actually forgot to reference um, step number four here, but this is pretty self-explanatory, so that's fine. And yeah, this is really just an action item summarizing some of the most important things that you should think about and contemplate on um, as you're, um, you know, thinking about the pricing in your agency and how to make it better. So ladies and gents, without further ado, thank you for watching this module with me. If you have any questions, go and post in the group or come on one of the coaching calls. You can talk to myself and Destiny. This is actually Destiny's expertise. She's been doing sales for the agency for years now, and I actually haven't done uh, really any sales calls. But I, I recorded this module anyways um, because I can speak to the information. But she is technically the better person to talk to when it comes to questions around this information, though I'll have no issues talking about it either. All right, ladies and gents, let's get to work. Thanks for watching this, and I'll see you in the next video. Ciao.